Los Angeles. Isn't that interesting? We have still so few women in the field, and yet it was formed by two women. So hats off to them. Uh, we're all about CIA. And uh, just want to give a shout out to my fellow board members at ISSA. It takes a lot to put all this on and to put on our monthly meetings, as well as our annual conference, which got postponed, unfortunately, due to the current COVID-19 issue. We do plan on getting that up and running again. But a big thanks to these hardworking individuals, all volunteers. Uh, you can join our community and stay connected with us, connect with your fellow InfoSec professionals and learn about future meetings such as this. Uh, that way you'll get the emails and we don't have to rely on social media. Speaking of social media, um, we also have some great sponsors that help us with everything that we do. Cybersecurity Collaborative, Wombat, the Linux Foundation and Linux Training Academy. Um, we thank them for their support. Here's our social media presence. Uh, for those of you over 30, we do have a Facebook, but for those of you under 30, there's Instagram. And we're of course on Twitter, Meetup and LinkedIn. We encourage you to join us there. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you know about our channel now. Uh, please take a look at some of the videos there. Some of them, the uh, conferences that we've put on over the years, some very good content, really well-known speakers. Um, we have our next meeting. We're doing these virtual meetings monthly. It will be June 17th. We always meet on the third Wednesday. And we have a great panel discussion about working with the board of directors. And as you can see, we have a, an all-star lineup as well. We've been very fortunate. Um, COVID-19 has impacted us severely in the ability to have in-person events, but it does give us the ability to have great speakers such as today and, and next month as well. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for that as well. Um, it's time to introduce our illustrious panel. And I, I'm not in hyperbole, it's really amazing. Uh, I wanna thank Jim Manico for taking the lead on helping build this panel with me. That is, I'm just overwhelmed with, with uh, who we've got here. Um, you must know most of these names, if not all of them. Andrew Vanderstock, he's the, the current co-lead of, of the OWASP Top 10 and the, uh, and the ASVS. Uh, I know that Jim has worked with Andrew on that quite a bit. Andrew was a former uh, global board member, so welcome. And we've got uh, Holly Grace Williams, technical director at Sakarma. Uh, Jack Menino, he's the CEO at Envisium. And Jim Manico, he's the founder of Secure Coding, uh, instructor at Manicode and, uh, and a, just a great jovial gentleman. Uh, John Steven, he's the uh, CTO at Zero North. Uh, Simon Bennett, security automation engineer at Mozilla, and he's the uh, Zap project lead. <laughs> you who are not familiar with Zap, if you want an unbelievable tool, all open source, OWASP endorsed and OWASP driven, uh, Zap can find out all about your systems. And I highly recommend you take a look at that. And last but not least, we have Tony Luceda Velez, CEO and founder of Veritrite. So I want to thank this great panel. And I also want to um, get going. I'm going to uh, stop my share and we can see everyone. And uh, so here's the thing. Um, when I talk to my fellow CISOs, right? Uh, the main concern they seem to have is phishing, um, finding and retaining talent, remote workers, budget, and securing the infrastructure. All reasonable and all really serious items for concern. But what's missing from that list? Where's layer seven? Where's application software security? Aren't all the hacks going in through software, right? So I'm here today and we've assembled this panel to remind people of how important this is. And it's incredibly important for you to share with your CIO, your CPO, uh, and everyone at work, the importance of security uh, in applications and software. So, you know, we have tons of, of apps out there and there's so much insecure code, it's mind boggling. Some of it is because the developers, when they're trained, they don't get security ingrained into the curriculum in school. It's changing a little bit, it's not there yet. Uh, so we have to 
team up, we being security professionals have to team up with the application teams and get champions and get them involved with this. But security has got to be involved throughout the entire software development life cycle. So let's hear from our panels. We usually don't want to hear from me much anymore and see what they've got to say. Uh, we're going to start pretty <clears throat> rudimentary uh, for now and then dive deeper. But um, I wanted to ask Andrew, uh, Andrew, you're on mute. So if you can uh, join us, my question for you is basically just what is application security and why is it so important? So application security is one of the um, foundation cornerstones, if you like, of every single application, regardless of whether it's a game or it's running the world economy. Without security, it can't do it well. Um, many games have actually suffered a lot of um, players leaving because of extensive cheating. So you can't say that application security isn't a necessary non-functional requirement. But I'm going to take you on a journey. In the early days, back in 1998 when I was doing this, I didn't know about any of um, the issues surrounding web apps. And we were just learning a little bit at a time. And so when OWASP found um, and started the developer guide, um, I started chipping in because I knew a lot of these things and I basically reinvented most of the things that other people also knew. Um, but by working together, we actually started to identify things. But back in those early days, we literally had, we had a browser extension that allowed us to pause requests. Imagine if we had modern tools with old apps. And yet back then, every app had cross-site scripting, every app had SQL injection, every app had access control issues, every app had authentication issues. It was easy to write a thick report back in those days. And it's because the development team didn't have the advice and the security team had only just learned about what these issues were. And unfortunately, too few of us were scientists to come up with evidence-based solutions and so a lot of it was hand-waving, do this, do that, patch this, patch this, um, put a web application firewall in front. And these were just band-aids. And what we needed to do was have a more academic rigor to the way that we actually suggested fixes. And those fixes needed to go into frameworks. So we see that now with CRSF, for example, has almost completely gone away because frameworks are dealing with it, which is the correct layer. So the reality is, Back then, there were breaches all the time, but less things were on the internet. Now we've had breaches in modern times and they are absolutely uh, targeting value. So one of the things that I would suggest is consider the value of your applications by the amount of data that's under management. And essentially, if you look at it from the point of view of these apps you know, run our business, they should have the same level of risk management as anything else. And part of that risk management is to do application security. Things are getting better, don't, don't get me wrong. It's very um, it's unlikely today to find SQL injection because again, frameworks are dealing with it for you. Um, and that is the correct solution in many cases. So do consider uh, encouraging your teams to actually um, you know, use modern frameworks like React that don't have cross-site scripting unless you choose to have it. Um, and so one of those things that I would suggest is build security in, you need to get into threat modeling. Um, you're absolutely, um, with the current scale, back in the early days, there was one app. I think many of you are actually running hundreds of apps. Which one do you do first? You can use tools to find out the worst offenders and then use specialists to help you with those worst offenders. My concerns are that with the scale and the sheer amount of code that exists, it's not getting any love. Uh, we're going to continue to have problems. So it's really important as you build new software or maintain existing software, do threat modeling. Tony UV will actually probably talk about threat modeling. I'd love for him to chip in and talk about that because quite frankly, that's the easiest way of identifying these sorts of issues that can get you serious fraud, serious um, you know, reputation damage. Um, don't just do the OS top 10. I'm the OS top 10 co-leader, but the application security verification framework is in my view, the minimum. The OS top 10 is an awareness piece. It's really good for your developers to become aware of application security, but to actually do things that can be testable, that's the ASVS. So coming back to the question, what is the importance of this? Application security is important to every single type of app. Anything above Hello World needs application security. It's, an, it's a given, it's the same as scalability. It's the same as confidentiality and integrity. If you have a banking system that can't add up, 
that's not a good banking system. If you can't have an application that can keep your um, users' details secure, that's not really a very good system. And so we need to make sure that we're addressing these basic, basic issues and then some of the more advanced issues by using threat modeling to identify what they are and then put some countermeasures or use better practices such as up-to-date frameworks and up-to-date, um, um, you know, more secure alternatives um, than what we used in the past. So um, when I speak to some of my uh, security professionals, um, you know, they might mention to me, oh, we don't have a full blown software development shop. So, you know, I don't, why should I care about AppSec? Uh, Jack and I were talking about this last week. Um, Jack, how do you answer those folks? Um, so I think, you know, any company or, or application team, development team of any size can, can care about security. Um, but how much can they actually invest and, and how much can they actually get done uh, is obviously very dependent upon the size of the team, um, funding. Uh, there's some easy uh, kind of layups that we can get done in security. Uh, there's really good open source tooling. Uh, the challenge that you need somebody to run those things. You need somebody to interpret um, the output from those things. You need somebody to take those things, uh, convince the developers that these things are more important to prioritize uh, than the rest of their development backlog. Uh, so, you know, you can care uh, at any size, right? But, you know, truth be told, uh, you know, a startup shouldn't be investing uh, or, you know, expect to even be near the same level of maturity in a year as say, um, you know, a top 10 bank, right? Uh, because they, they invest in, at, at, a, at a very different level and everything like that. So. Um, it's really important to understand what you can actually do and what you should outsource. Uh, not every team has that luxury, right? And they need to make everybody a champion internally. Um, you know, over the past few years, right, we've pushed things like security champion programs. Uh, but interestingly enough, it was kind of in an economy of excess. And now that we're uh, getting back to where, you know, teams are significantly underfunded, uh, teams are shrinking, uh, headcounts going down while, you know, the features and things that have to happen, um, they're in some cases increasing, right? So it's, it's really hard to say that, you know, organizations should prioritize security above everything else, but um, there's obviously consequences of not, right? So um, that's, that's my short answer to that. And I've had some discussions and um, I've shared also with my peers that, hey, you know, if you have to outsource and have your software developed and or hosted, how do you evaluate the quality of that build? How do you evaluate the, the professionalism of that software development team? You need to understand software security in order to assess them. And so the, the answers that I'll get, well, we don't have a, a shop. So, um, you know, it's, I don't care about OWASP or application security. That's, that's the road to, to perdition, right? So you've got to stay up on this because software is in everything now. Software is in your IoT devices, software is in every, stuff in your organization that you might not even think about how important that, that is. Um, hey Richard, I just wanted to comment on some of the things that you know that was said thus far that I think it's really important for the audience. And that's on the topic of, of the word application, right? Application might have a connotation to some people's minds versus software. And I think that uh, for those that are out there that are getting into software security, application security, you know, recognize that software is everywhere, right? Software is in devices, software is in machinery, software is in, you know, obviously, you know, uh, distributed systems and web applications and mobile, et cetera. So getting your mind behind the importance of the security of that software is so important, um, you know, to, to Andrew's earlier point. And, you know, it, Jack brought up some good points that, Oftentimes in companies, you know, especially now we're in, a, we're in a pandemic, right? You have global recession in, in multiple parts of the world. You have budgets that are being cut. You have to kind of think a little bit more strategically about application security slash software security. And I think that's, um, you know, the challenge that everyone has. And hopefully through this discussion, we can kind of provide some options on automation, on integration, on how to find out where to focus, what maybe through threat models. So um, just wanted to kind of weigh in there. Why don't you talk a little bit about the threat modeling? That's the second time we've heard that uh, today, and some people probably aren't doing a very good job of that. 
Yeah, sure. Happy to do that. So for those of that um, haven't really engaged in application threat modeling, think of it as a way to collaborate <clears throat> with multiple individuals, whether it be engineers, developers, architects, even business analysts that might be laying down requirements for software or an application to come together to understand a model of threats. And it's amazing what you can find out just through a roundtable discussion, simulating attack patterns that are realistic for your industry based upon your deployment model, based upon your data consumption model, based upon you know, multiple different things. Um, but overall, threat modeling, as the name implies, is a model of threats that you can throw against a software or applications that you want to uh, preemptively identify, right? Before your attacker does. And so you do typically an architectural review to understand things like, what's my call flow, right? In, in my application or in my software, who's calling what? What is the security context of that who, right? Are they elevated deities in my application or are do they simply read uh, users that are just pulling information. What's my data consumption model? You know, is that data sensitive? Do I care about that data? Um, what's the escalation of privileges model, you know, associated with that? And so it's in, in multiple um, instances, there's been a lot of people that have commented about how much they have found use cases that they, they didn't even know about by having that collaborative discussion of with uh, UI developers, client side developers, back end developers, you know, application tier developers to be able to kind of share this is what my component is doing. And then let's throw in some abuse cases. And so it's, it's a good collaborative way. And I like the collaboration aspect in threat modeling because if we all recognize, and I think we all do here, security oftentimes has this adversarial relationship with a lot of our constituents in, in businesses and enterprises. So finally, we have more of a collaborative discussion, trying to all get to the same, you know, end goal of a resilient, safe application for users so that it can be consumed effectively. Now, you talked about the collaboration. Um, is it just security in the application development team or do you want uh, business folks involved in that threat modeling discussion? That's a great question. You know, my personal approach, um, I'm, I'm partial to a risk-based uh, threat model, but there's others that are out there. I think that the risk-based model really allows for collaboration for people that might be product managers, um, people that might be on the business side who have a stake in the game to lose if that application A goes down, loses information, gets compromised, introduces bad reputation. So, you know, I, in, in my sense, I think that it does provide, oftentimes, especially if you're doing software development for the enterprise, right? Let's say you work for a Fortune 500 and you're developing software for an enterprise, you have business requirements that's coming from the enterprise, right? In terms of uh, requirements for use and data use and, you know, maybe SLAs, uh, there might be some regulatory requirements that have to be fulfilled. So, you know, developers themselves need that sort of guidance and need that sort of like uh, checks and balances. So having that conversation, you know, threat modeling is typically associated with being earlier within a SDLC process. So around design time to have those conversations, I think is very helpful. Yeah, if I could just chip in on that. Uh, I think the collaboration thing is absolutely key. And for organizations who are not used to doing this kind of thing, they might see it as a very kind of heavyweight formal process. But I don't think it has to be. I think you can start off um, very easily and just start just uh, having a conversation with your developers, with ops staff, with the business. And you can just start like, what's the worst that could happen? What are you worried about? You know, what could we think of that can go wrong? And you can all take turns in and trying to come up with a common understanding of the things that could go really horribly wrong. And we have something called a rapid risk assessment at Mozilla and the developers love it. They've, they actually look forward to these meetings. They enjoy it, they enjoy the process. They come up with some um, threat models I just never have thought of. Um, so you can make it a bit of a game. You can have fun with it. Uh, it doesn't have to be something really rigorous and formal. You can only do it if you've been doing security for 20, 20 years or anything like that. 
And I think I think if if you're new to application security or if you're part of an application security team and you're trying to measure your organization around how good you are at design review and where you should be going, I would take a look at the new version of OpenSAM. This is one of the OWASP resources that's the software assurance maturity model, in particular under model verification architecture assessment, you'll see a, a maturity model to suggest how to approach threat modeling and design review. And like Simon says, for, for level one, maturity level one, ad hoc review of architecture for unmitigated security threats is a great idea, but I wouldn't stop there, depend on how deep down the open stand maturity stack you wanna go. Level two says, analyze the architecture for known threats. Level three says, see the architecture review results back in enterprise architecture, organization design principles and patterns, security solutions and reference architectures. So these patterns that you come up with and review that are that are done correctly, you feed back that in, in a loop and make that standardized throughout the, the company at level three maturity. So in short, you want to do threat modeling. You want to analyze where you are and look at the levels above you in open SAM or things like BSIM, hey John, or BSIM to understand what other people are doing around application security to measure yourself against those maturity models and studies. Thank you. Good points, good points. Thanks, folks. Um, I'm asked a lot uh, by my peers um, about testing during the SDLC. And, you know, that we, they traditionally there's been dynamic and static and, and manual testing. Um, I wanted to ask Holly to give us the latest and greatest advice about testing, you know, what type and when uh, in a good uh, development process. Holly, what do you think? I think uh, I'm going to give you a biased answer, of course, because as a, as a penetration tester, I would like to lead with manual testing and talking about how penetration testing is uh, the best thing for the greater good. But really, when you start looking at things like developing new applications, one of the big things that comes out from that is, you know, at, at what point do you start testing and what kind of testing schedule should you have? Uh, and those kinds of questions can be can be really, really difficult. You, you want to start obviously as early as possible within the software development lifecycle so that you can catch vulnerabilities, you can catch security issues sooner. So you're not pushing towards a go live day and then suddenly find that you have uh, a lot of security issues. And also you want to avoid the kind of traditional pen testing approach of looking at security on a, a time-based schedule. So it's still really frequent within our space to see companies that are performing penetration testing activities annually. And tying your security testing to how many times you've been around the sun is probably not effective, especially if you look at how you're building software now. If you're talking agile, if you're talking DevOps, those kinds of things, then tying testing to a time-based schedule is probably not going to work. You're going to want to tie it into uh, the kind of sprints that you're doing, your, your, your actual development lifecycle. So how, how should we be testing? Well, if you look at how applications are tested from a, a functional point of view, just from a, is this thing working? You know, we're pushing left on that and we're, we're building a lot more automation into it. And I think security testing needs to go that way as well. So yes, I can talk to you about dynamic application security testing, manual pen testing, those kinds of things. But I think the big thing that a lot of companies, to look, companies need to look for is um, if we can't run pen testing every single day of the year because it's financially infeasible or because it's just a very, very heavy approach, how can we bring automation into testing to make sure that we can start it earlier in the software development lifecycle and also we can run it more efficiently, either from a time consumption point of view or very often just from a cost point of view. I know that someone else has some good stuff about testing. That's a big topic. Andrew, go ahead. Richard. Yeah. Oh, go can ahead. I just quickly go? Um, the application security verification standard, just sort of putting uh, it out there, is actually written as how to test for that issue. And so you can write integration and unit tests uh, for those issues directly and then tested every single build, which is fantastic. Jim, go ahead. I, I think the big trends in, in security testing the last couple of years is the push harder towards automation, right? In that, in that we want to, we want to, I think, I mean, we want to go beyond agile. We want to be, agile says that we're releasing high quality versions of the software on a cyclic basis. But DevOps really says, 
I'm releasing production quality versions of the software a thousand times a day. And Agile is ancient compared to what DevOps is preaching. To do DevOps, yeah, there's a culture change and all these intangible things. But what's tangible about DevOps is the need to do mammoth automation and everything you're doing in the dev life cycle. So step, and if you look at back to a maturity model, the OpenSAM maturity model, unlike studies like BSIM, OpenSAM is a real maturity model, John. And, and with, with OpenSAM, we, we look at the model verification security testing segment, which says at level one, they say perform security testing manual and tool-based. And at level one, the, the scalable baseline stream says, utilize automated testing tools. So my point, Richard, is according to OpenSAM, you having heavy automation to do security testing is not a mature level. That's just the baseline of what we should be doing today. And I, when I ask teams, how often do you do security testing of your app? The answer should be, well, a thousand times a day. So level one says do security testing. Level two of OpenSAM says to make security testing during development more complete and efficient through automated complemented, through automation complemented with regular manual security penetration testing. Level two says I got rich automation and regular pen testing to address what, what, what automation doesn't address well. Level three says now I'm, I'm embedding security testing as an integrated part of the development and deployment processes where I'm now using it more of a, of a checkpoint, hopefully an automated checkpoint when I just try to build or check code in or deploy code in. So again, I like OpenSAM I like, and I, I love BSIM to see what people are really doing in the world around security testing so I can measure myself against these maturity models to see how to up my game. And, and again, the, the answer, again, a lot of people say we should be looking at automated security testing. Richard, automated security testing is, is the baseline entry of AppSec these days. If you're not doing it, you're really not doing AppSec testing at all to some degree. I'll leave it at that. All right, that's that's my take. So I'm, I'm going to have to jump in here. Um, so basically because um, Zap, as far as we're aware, is the world's most frequently used app web application scanner. So that is what people are using. Um, that's not to say, you know, there's some really great commercial tools out there. Um, so, but if you're looking for a free open source scanner, then Zap is the one to use. It is used. Um, so it, it is designed for automation. And I think it's absolutely key to get the developers using this as early as possible. So as soon as you have something to run, you should be using Zap and you should be automating it. But as I you know, always say, automated security testing does not replace the pen testers like Holly. They're gonna find loads of fun stuff. Um, but what we're trying to do is find the, 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 the simplest, the, the, the most common vulnerabilities, the, the types of vulnerabilities that we can find in automated ways, and there are plenty we can't, um, but it's also to identify hotspots. And it could be identifying um, particular frameworks or whatever that people are using or ways people are developing things, or it could be identifying particular developers who haven't had enough training or anything like that. It's identifying potential problems as early as possible so they can be fixed as early as possible. I think I definitely agree uh, on there, but but maybe there's some distinctions to be made here between what we mean by automation, right? Because there's a big difference between running a vulnerability scanner once a month and then what, what was mentioned earlier with the ASVS saying we should be doing security testing as part of unit and integration testing, right? They're, they're both under this umbrella of automation, but, but they're different things, right? Oh, sure. um, and I also just want to throw in the point there of um, your pen testers should be really, really happy if you're using automation and you're using tools like you know, Zap or whatever to, to pick up on the, the easy vulnerabilities because the pen tester wants to come in and show just the cool stuff. We absolutely don't want to come in and show the basic stuff. It's cost inefficient for the business and it bores the pen testers. Holly, I, I, want, to, I want to define automation, like modern automation as... I'm running uh, modern application security automation is I'm running well-tuned static analysis, dynamic analysis, and third-party library scanning minimum all, all, many, many times throughout the day. And, I'm, and, and if that's done maturely, I've usually tuned these scanners in two different ways. One way I've tuned it where it runs in a few minutes or less for the daily check-ins and the, and the frequent scans that happen throughout the day. And then I also have it run in full mode, all three of these tools at the end of the day 
in a more long cycle scan. And, I, and so I'm able to run the really deep hour long scan once a day while running all these small daily fast and, fast and critical scans throughout the dev process. And how to, how to dial that in, it's not a product. It's not a turnkey solution. It's experimenting with the different DevOps tool chains, experimenting with integration with commercial and open source tooling to get the right mix of static analysis, dynamic analysis, and third-party library scanning, and hopefully unit testing that's custom to your app, all running many times throughout the day. Again, you can't productize that. that that's using open source tooling and other infrastructure and people to tune it to get this to work. And when it's working, Mwah, it's magic, right? Because I'm running, I'm running this combination of tooling all throughout the dev process, which lets me scream out code and be able to reduce exposure windows because of my ability to fix fast as one element of this discipline. So all the so that's real modern automation, and it's hard, it's hard to get right. It requires a lot of sophisticated tuning to dial it in. Um, and one last note, like where automation fails is when people like build a DevOps, they build a DevOps pipeline and then force everyone to use that pipeline. And then you just stop your whole company. It's gotta be tuned for every individual app and it's, it's non-trivial. But that, I think that level of firing many, many security tests from at least three categories of tools all throughout the day as you're writing code is important. And last note, Richard, how do you address the legacy problem well, that's once you have this automated infrastructure of testing in place, you can start onboarding legacy apps to have even your legacy apps going through this daily cycle of scanning as well. Hey, and now we're doing automation AppSec. Now, now we're at least doing testing in a, in, in a fairly rigorous way by modern standards, I would dare say. I just want to jump in here real quick and talk about you know, automation. So it's, it's really important because I actually, although I agree with a lot of things that you just said, Jim, it is so important, like, for example, it's so important to tool your existing tools, right? That, that's important. Um, automation, I think, takes on a different definition totally. Um, and I think it leans more to what Holly was inferring. The tools themselves are doing some level of automation encapsulated into the product itself. They are automatically running what some, you know, good pen tester has committed into the product itself as a good injection attack or as a good, you know, bypass attack, authentication bypass attack, et cetera. Uh, by the way, the Z attack proxy is a phenomenal open source commercial tool. If you have not played with it, please go get it today. Uh, can't highly recommend it enough. Simon, you've done a phenomenal job with all the people that have been involved. So kudos to you on there. But going back to automation, um, I think automation is really, you know, Jack hit on some good points, you know, we got less resources, less time, less money. Um, that's just the way things are. So you need to save time. The, the thing with tooling is that anybody can find flaws. That's not the hard part in anything information security. Finding things is not hard. It's fixing them that's harder because you have to put so many things into context. I'm not saying that finding things is trivial because finding good things, like especially with a manual approach, which completely I want to echo um, Holly's comments there, manual is definitely needed. Automation is not a replacement for manual by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so I'm trying to wrap in all these different points here, but automation in my mind is really about scaling, right? It's about how do I identify, validate, uh, funnel into a remediation queue, and then do my risk decisioning. Do I accept? Do I remediate? Do I transfer? Right, that part is is the is where the automation it needs to happen and is happening today with various enterprises. They are looking to see how can I find things faster. Now, to your point on tooling, I think there is a level when you think about automation in general. We think about like you know the evolution of from the industrial age to the technological age. There's been advancements, right, in order to save time, convenience. The same thing is applicable here in application security. We need to be able to find things that can um, not just simply, you know, connect two hoses together and then, you know, receive a lot of information because to be honest, a lot of initial output from some level of tooling could be a lot of noise. And going back to the point of not enough time, not enough resources, if you're just going to amplify that noise into someone's desk, 
you know, then all you're doing is creating more workload. You might be even desensitizing them with security noise to really um, appreciate some of the finer findings from, um, you know, a security tool. So it's important to, and this, I, I want to bring it back to threat modeling. I think that doing an application threat model can actually serve as a good blueprint for both testing and automation. Defining your model of threats that you're concerned about. Maybe you're concerned about continuity threats. So you have to say, okay, well, what are my attack patterns that would give way to realizing a threat motive around you know, breaking continuity? Then you enumerate those and see how they affect your manual testing as a blueprint or also your automation you know, test cases. So I think that um, just in, in summary, automation is not just about you know, the tool itself running multiple times a day and spitting out results, but how that can be funneled into you know, a, a, a process I, overall. I agree. Let, let, let me follow up on that real quick. I mean, I, I, the thing I agree with you most is if you're not fixing bugs, you're not really doing AppSec at all. I, I wanna start, that's my main principle is, you. I define a good program, and this is a weak metrics to point to John for a second, but if you're fixing bugs at a certain rate, you're probably doing decent AppSec. I know it's minimizing the problem, but I, I tend to see that in, the, in the, the, the statistics I do see on remediation programs. And one more thing, Tony, all I'm trying to say about testing is, if I build a, an automated testing pipeline with even with the triage, e even with the will to fix bugs and integration to JIRA and all the pipeline I need in a security testing automated setup to integrate well with the SDLC and the will from the CEO that you have a certain SLA to fix bugs, all that in place, great. All I'm trying to say is I've seen companies build security testing pipelines and then try to force all their apps through it, and it doesn't work that way. It re when you start setting up automated testing pipelines, you're gonna need some configuration per app, which limits scalability. And, and I've seen people fix that problem by weakening the testing capability to scale better. That's great, but now you're losing fidelity as you reach scale, and th that's the only point I'm trying to make. And I'm gonna go back to what I agreed with as I, as I mute myself. The point I agree with you is, you're either fixing security bugs or you're not as a development group. You're patching bugs or you're not. And that's how I, I, I really reduce AppSec down to, down to getting it right. And, and I think that was a point you were making as well. And I'm with you on that, Tony UV. Just wanted to point out that security testing automation is hard per app to, to triage and set up. Hey, John, do <clears throat> you have anything to add to this discussion? Very little, almost nothing. <laughs> So um, I, I think um, it's hard to call a man in front of a unicorn wearing a cowboy hat parochial. Um, but uh, I, <laughs> I, I think um, there's plenty that we can optimize. And the people on this, this call are extremely good as practitioners, having for decades optimized these individual practices, as well as their overall application in security initiatives. Um, any one of these individual techniques, whether it's an expert or an automation that's a commercial strength or if it's open source, for the, for the two decades of my personal experience, I never found any of those techniques to find more than 25% of what I reported critical and high to a customer and that they agreed to fix and actually followed up on. So what we have to understand is that we're going to need more than one thing. There is no silver bullet thing that we can apply. Each of those things has its own way of being optimized. Automation is key to making sure that that, optim you know, the, that that expertise or that open source or that commercial product scales. I would encourage people to do what's easiest, pick the low hanging fruit. If there are one-off little checks you can put in your pipeline, maybe they reflect what an expert told you once in a really expensive review, or maybe it's just something you know that happens stupid, do that. Um, also understand maybe it's maybe it's you know something like an open source tool that you can automate like a breakman or a bandit, um, or maybe it's automation you can apply because you've built it and it's fancy for a commercial capability. Fine, but I would challenge the notion that you know um, you need to dig into any individual approach really deeply to get scale and consistency and success. Just keep picking low hanging fruit. And I would also challenge the, um, the traditional notion that we need to get earlier and we need to focus on the fix of the bug in the code. 
we live in a brave new world where everything is outsourced, IT to cloud, code to open source. It's a shared responsibility model. What it means to fix software has changed. You may update a, a configuration to your Amazon uh, you know, config. You may uh, change the way your orchestration configuration works. You may put a compensating control in place. A lot of people are realizing that all of the advice that this group and others gave you know, prior, um, there may be an easier way to do it. Maybe we had optimized a way of doing something in the past, um, but there's a much easier fix for in a shared responsibility model in a modern development life cycle. Um, so what I would say is keep it simple with everything you do, pick the low hanging fruit and make sure that you do leave behind automation that makes sure that developers, SREs and operations folk can pick that fruit automatically after you leave. And if you keep doing that 10, 12, 15 times, you will have built a really well-tuned organizational capability that hopefully meets your threat model implicitly or explicitly. Um, and it works well for your organization. And it may cost us nothing. I'll just simply respond to that and say that, you know, that there, is, there is some risk to that in the sense that when you, when you hear the soundbite of like focus on low hanging fruit, the takeaway risk is that, you know, and there's a lot of companies that are buying tools and they're literally relying on what a tool extraneous to their business knowledge, their business plan, their customers or information. I mean, extraneous to so many factors are just going to say, here's your high, medium, low, here's your heat map. And so go focus on the low hanging fruit if you have you know, high critical things or things that are easily remediated with patches. But it might not actually address some of the threats that are viable, A, B, credible, uh, and then C, you know, things that actually have the biggest impact. So although I agree that you can definitely um, cover more ground and make greater impact, there's multiple different CISOs out there that literally buy what I call the, they follow the Noah's Ark security and they buy two of every app scan tool out there. And they just fire them up. You know, they, they might do some level of calibration, probably not nearly enough um, to what we would consider to be fully calibrated and, and rightly configured. And they just rely on the tool to be able to give them a sea of findings. And I, I think that, you know, I don't, I don't think that's what you're saying. I think that, um, but, but I just wanted to basically make sure that yeah, to, to be very system. clear, I don't equate low hanging fruit with tools. If you Google John Stephen, you know, OWASP threat modeling, you'll see a picture of me when I must have been 12 before I could grow facial hair, giving like, I think the first threat modeling presentation at OWASP. So yeah, I mean, low hanging fruit is not just the tools. Uh, yeah, so I think it's just good to just define. Yeah, yeah. The so fruit. remember I said, you know, you may take the low hanging fruit. It may be something an expert told you and you find a way to automate that or repeat that check the expert did. I also mentioned threat modeling. And, you know, if you know that this is your model of threat and that this concerns you most, you may find low hanging fruit in that model. What I'm trying to get away from is the historic notion that you have to become an expert in terms of depth or breadth in terms of the applications of these tools and techniques. And everybody has their own religion that they like. Some people like SAM, some people like ASVS or whatever. There's a bunch of different religions that get you up the mountain. Right. Um, some of those religions are practice based like those are. Some of the religions are threat modeling based. Ultimately, I think everybody on this call is very convinced that organizations need to assess their threats, understand the risks that those threats will, will pose and respond, respond accordingly. So, let me, let me, a very brief note uh, to, to Tony, like low hanging fruit, like, for example, for a certain organization have this glorified automated security tool chain that I'm talking about, that might not be low hanging fruit for them. It's not part of their dev culture. They haven't done it yet. That's a big mountain to climb. They want to do that someday. But calling a pen tester and getting a pen test, that could be low hanging fruit. I write a check, I get a pen test, and I might find some ultra critical vulnerabilities. And they might find big problems in my transactional APIs that no scanner found. And so I don't, I don't see low hanging fruit as only looking for low level vulnerabilities. I see it as let's use, let's do security activities of the different quadrants of BSIM or SAM or whatever religion you want to look at. 
let's let's do some activities there that are easy for me to achieve. And one of those activities is hiring a pen tester who could find you hire a good pen tester. I know some really really mature pen testers who find some deep dark stuff, some of the most critical, difficult to find things, but it's still low hanging fruit activity to get that rolling. Yeah, low hanging fruit in the context of the finder A is one thing. Low hanging fruit in terms of the remediator is something else as well. Oh, so I, that's I got why it. it's really important. You got to understand that out there, there's people that are fixing things. There's people that are finding things. So low hanging fruit means different things to different people. But yeah. I, I, I mean, I think we're all in agreement here. The one thing I'll just simply say on the religion front is that I don't think necessarily, you know, oftentimes there's different like, you know, uh, theologies on doing X, on risk management, on pen testing or whatever. I don't think that they're necessarily religions because you can mix and match what you want. You can take ASVS and make it play with OpenSAM. You can take, you know, uh, BSIM and play with OpenSAM. You can take totally. OpenSAM and play it and, and, and map it to BSIM if you want, right? You can flip flip the yeah, script. I agree. Um, the, there's the, the recommendations, and I think to your point, John, because I think, you know, you, you make a good one, is that the people that are out there shouldn't just take the silver bullet recommendations, as John mentioned, and just go like sheeps and say, let me just do this because this is going to work. It's about finding your own rhythm with the, 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 the advice, the frameworks, the guidance, the standards, you know, that are, that are out there. Uh, Andrew started talking about yeah. the, um, the ASVS over the OWASP top 10. I personally, you know, I, I run the Atlanta chapter here and I'm not a big fan of the OWASP top 10. I haven't been. I like the ASVS much better. I think it's a lot more actionable. So, but there might be the OWASP top 10 may work for others and that's perfectly fine. So it's about picking your poison and making it interrelatable to other things that you bring into the fold. You might want to take a threat modeling methodology that's risk centric and cut 50% of it out, right? And because it works for you, you might want to map it to another framework like NIST CSF. The point is, is that there really isn't a religion. It's about what you build custom for your organization that fits based upon so many factors. So I just want to jump in here. I don't like the use of the word religion. Um, because it implies faith that something's going to work. And unfortunately, we haven't had the science background to make this a leap. One of the problems with the OS top 10 is it's self-referential. It's always going to look like itself because people search for the OS top 10 and not anything else. And yet the things that actually get you serious fraud, serious business loss are not in the OS top 10. And so it's really important for people to realize the OS top 10 is like the starting point. One of the things that I would like to just address there is and again, to get away from this religion concept, because I think we're all in furious agreement. I'm working on getting data collection at the moment for the OS top 10, but we actually want to collect more data than we actually need so that we can actually get to what actually matters. Because if we can say to you with some certainty, these are the things that you should really focus on, that will help the ASVS be better. It will help the OS top 10 focus in on the things that really truly matter as well. And so I do actually say to the people on this uh, um uh, podcast, if you could actually help us with data, and that's simply CWEs and the number of times apps have actually had those CWEs, you can actually help improve this field and get rid of the religion aspect and go to a, a science-based, this will actually help. And the sooner we get there, the better it'll be for everyone, because we only have a limited amount of funds, time and resources and attention spans to tell developers this is actually really important. And if we're concentrating on the things that don't matter, We've wasted that opportunity. So I do ask people on this call, if you could actually share that data with us, I'd love to hear from you. I'm on Twitter and I'll, I'll bow out at that point. Thanks. Sounds like violent agreement. Uh, just for clarity's sake, I did hear uh, a few times today that you should not rely on one product. Uh, forget the pen testing part for a second, just as far as a tools. Oh. Oh, that you could get at least a couple of scanners, correct? And, and not just one product, Richard, but any one category. Again, one, I'm one technique, yeah. And I, I use a combination of dy DAS, dynamic scanning. And these days, I, I, I mean, if you're not, why not run Zap? It's free and it's a very mature scanner. I usually run Zap plus one. Zap plus one other commercial scanner side to side in an automated pipeline. The next, some kind of static analysis. And that really depends on what you're doing. If I want a, a general purpose kind of canalis engine, I'll buy one of the big commercial ones. There's also things like John mentioned, Bandit, really good for Python. There's Breakman, open source, really good for the Ruby on Rails world. 
And there are a lot of these little specialized scanners for different frameworks and languages. I usually run a commercial scanner plus one tuned. Now we're at four. So then, then third party library scanning. And that's a whole separate, relatively new category. That's OWASP top 10 A9. Tony, OWASP top 10 A9, great category. The o D Tony does like the OWASP top 10, so he doesn't like, he doesn't like to secure his serialization, his serialization endpoints. He doesn't oh, like- now, now you're reaching, Jim. Now you're reaching. He, does, he doesn't like to hit parameterize his queries. Uh, the OWASP that's top rich. 10 is, is valid. Tony is just being a little- a little Hey, Richard, can you put some demonic horns on me as a- <laughs> No, no. It's, but the point is, I, I have a Google alert, Tony, that says we base our security program off the OWASP top 10. Then I find him and go harass them. As, I as want to echo what Andrew said. Great start, but it's, <laughs> it needs to be science based. right? It can't be just a unilateral. You know the history of the OWASP top 10, so I don't need to go in there. Right. So that, that we need to have it so that there's metrics. What, what, are, what are we seeing in the field in terms of attacks? And it's gotten better. It's gotten way better from its origins, and you can't negate that. So, let me answer real quick. So again, uh, two dynamic scanning engines, a static analysis engine that's good for your specific language or framework if you can, a third-party library scanning engine, OWASP dependency check, plus one commercial one, and and then fourth category is usually a whole bunch of grab bag stuff from your from custom tooling to uh, 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 odd little things that some dev wrote that's good for your world, good, mature unit testing. I put I asked in the grab bag category as a consideration. I don't give it a, I don't give it its own category. It's an experimental in the fourth random category. Then a bunch of your miscellaneous stuff, all that together is a, is a, is a good complete picture, I dare say, from an automated only point of view. They do, they do manual stuff on top of that on a cyclic basis as well, of course. Let me talk more about IAST. No. You. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just chip in before without being the, on the IAST side. But so Zap is a DAST scanner, but I would never say it's all you need. There is no silver bullet. I'd agree with Jim. You want the SAS, you want your checking in the uh, vulnerable libraries, all these good things. Um, yeah, you, you shouldn't rely on any one tool. But I, I so, see, I, I've seen okay. Zap go head to head against a hundred thousand dollar commercial tool and defeat it soundly. So I don't want to minimize. So Zap is one of many tools we can run. But keep in mind, this is an open source tool. Go look at all the source code. The intellectual property behind that is is worth untold fortune, in my opinion. So I, I always start with that because it's it's freebie and it's very mature. Still beats commercial stuff. It also what I like about Zap as well. It also kicks the commercial community to do better. So I, I love Zap. Good work, Simon. So I just want to chip in about IAST. IAST requires people. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm um, on screen at the moment, but fundamentally, IAST requires you to actually test your application. IAST, for those who aren't familiar with it, is interactive security testing. And what it does is it does um, reflection based uh, security tests. And when the code executes, it just checks to see if there's an actual issue. Um, the thing that is key to this is you must execute the code. If you don't execute a, a code pathway that uh, IS doesn't know about and hasn't actually run, you're not going to get a result. So you do need to actually invest in full functional testing of your application, which is what I would suggest anyway. And then let IS find automatically the security vulnerabilities in the code that it sees. I think the having full unit test is um, actually key to dyna dynamic testing as well. So DAS tools like Zap can explore applications, but I mean, the most effective way is always going to have it be a human sitting there, whether it's a pen tester or, or a QA person, just going through the application, going through all the functionality. But obviously those things you can't automate. Um, so having unit tests, which drive your dynamic scanner, just helps it understand your application better and make sure it fine, it goes through all of the paths. Um, so it's definitely key with IAST. I think it's pretty key with DAST as well. Yeah, I just wanted to share a, a funny little story quickly. Uh, I was talking to uh, developers and trying to get them on the same team you know, to build a good dynamic SDLC with the word S ahead of it. And, um, you know, we, we were reviewing results from one of our scanners and uh, they said, oh, no, no, these, these aren't our vulnerabilities. Said, what do you mean? I said, those are in the libraries we use. 
we shouldn't be scanning the libraries because we didn't build those. And I went, oh, okay. So part of a good security professional's job is to work with the app dev team. And, and sometimes it's education, right? Um, you know, the third party libraries now are one of the, the worst things out there. Uh, anyone want to share any horror stories about third party libraries and why, uh, what about 80% of them are insecure that you can get now? Well, I, I mean, let's just take a step back for a second, right? So, so you field software to run your business or to run your organization or because you want to do something and your risk is the aggregation of the software that you wrote, the software that you included and called, uh, or the infrastructure or services that you rely on. So yesterday's open source problem is today's AWS problem. Uh, or third, you know, but the point is that there's your code that you wrote as a person, and then there's the rest of the iceberg underwater that you didn't write, but that you either incorporated as open source or called as, you know, web services or, or cloud, or cloud uh, you know, infrastructure or whatever. You, you know, there are plenty of people, and in fact, most of the Wall Street Journal, you know, quote unquote breaches that, I, that I've looked at recently have been because of cloud services that people either put out um, uh, you know, in, in a way that was unprotected or called uh, in the wrong way or failed to use a security control associated with. So because more and more of the software that your risk posture uh, results from is not the code you personally wrote, your risk from open source, from cloud services and from other third party code is gonna increase over time uh, until the trend changes. And you should expect that it's 10 to 100 to one the code you write versus the code that will cause you risk that you're not responsible for. Absolutely. So, you know, the low hanging fruit may not be within that one to 10% of the code you wrote. It may be in the other 90, you know, to, to 99%. Ignoring that would be very foolish. You don't build one to 10% of a fence around a house. It doesn't, it's not effective. Um, so if you don't have a strategy for how you're gonna uncover vulnerabilities in your open source, and in the services you rely on. If you don't have a strategy for how you're gonna harden those things and make sure you leverage their security controls, uh, then you don't have a complete strategy. Um, so so I, would, I would double down on your statement and say, you can't confine it only to open source. You have to think about your cloud infrastructure and the, the, the services you call. Very well said, John. I think it's very interesting the the talking about open source libraries or libraries in general. And I think we've always been telling people that you should be patching your operating systems and patching the the services you buy. Well, you should be patching your libraries as well. And by that I mean keeping them up to date. Because the problem is the longer you leave the libraries at old versions, the harder it is to update them. And it might be fine for the first six months, a year or whatever, but if they if vulnerabilities are found in older libraries, and they often are, then to actually upgrade, update those from you know, several versions back to the latest thing where they got the patch can be really, really painful. So you know, it's, not, it's not easy, but keeping your libraries up to date is just as important as patching your operating system. So it's a shame Jeremy Long isn't on this call because I'd like to get into a fight with him right yeah. now, riffing on what you just said, Simon. No, so when when Jeremy Heart when Heartbleed no, no 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 Jeremy would agree, John. Don't don't be smirch. He'd agree with Simon, but I'm about to disagree. So so when when Heartbleed came out, <laughs> when when Heartbleed came out, um, you know I of course scanned my whole home situation for what I had to go upgrade. You know where I was behind, and I had a bunch of software that that I needed to fix because I had written it and it wasn't. It wasn't current. Interestingly enough, there were a few things. There were six different versions of SSL in my television. Of course, I couldn't patch any of them. Five of them were so old they weren't vulnerable, as were all of the versions of OpenSSL that ship with my MacBooks. So in that case, Apple avoided Heartbleed in large, in large, in large case because they had failed to upgrade. But they had go to fail in their per in their SSL stack. So let's move on, though. So let's so what's interesting though is that your mitigation strategy may 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 tell you that you stay very rigorous and current with your upgrades, uh, or you may take a compensating approach. I'm I'm not advocating for uh, for keeping your libraries out of date as a security strategy, but it is interesting. You know, Richard said a funny story about open source. That that is kind of interesting in that I in my house I had 
much less work to do. Frankly, and how come you don't him. demonize John like you did me? Come on. I love John better than you. That's why, Tony. I clearly, clearly it shows. <laughs> but go ahead, John. No, th th think about this as a maturity model. At the lowest level, you just don't update third-party libraries. And John, there are some situations where I need to do that for offline products where telemetry matters and one update changes the timing of something by 0.001 seconds and my tool doesn't work anymore. There are rare cases where that level of maturity is acceptable. Up a level, I'm usually using a scanning tool to check my third party libraries to tell me if they're out of date or not. And this is a turning quickly turning into a billion dollar industry. And I call BS on a lot of it that we shouldn't be using it. Level three is what Simon is saying, where I don't even care about secure, this billion dollar industry of third party library security scanners. And instead, I just keep everything up to date. And here's why that's so important because so many security problems, they go unreported. And, and, and and similar issues around that, where you just have a culture, uh, or not, not culture, forget culture. If you have development process where you're updating your third party libraries on a daily basis, that means you're taking the pain little by little and the updatability factor of your software at all times is high. And that's a big deal on multiple levels. The problem with that is you just bought into dependency problems, where if I'm keeping all of my code in most major languages up to date, then I'll have collision problems by keeping it all up to date and, and mature teams will go address that. I saw a problem where I updated everything and things broke. Well, I went to the one file and I went to its config and bumped the version to the new one and everything worked and all was well. Sometimes that dependency fix is easy to keep. Sometimes it's not, of course, but that's the most mature level I think is having a culture where a, pro, a set of mature processes we're keeping all of your third-party library dependencies up to date at all times is critical. And as a side note, this is not a joke. Like one of the biggest ways organizations were compromised in the last many years is with struts, John, struts two. This is a code, I don't, because it's code that requires keeping it up to date and sophisticated configuration, two phases to it. So, I mean, and, and last note, when I started developing in the 90s, the attitude was, and this is a, a standard I was told to code to by a quality part of my organization, one of the top Fortune Fives. They said, once you get it working, don't update the libraries. That was the standard for a major corporation because they didn't want me to break anything. I'll leave it at that. That's the 90s. So I'm yeah, glad we're not in the 90s Jim anymore. Um, I just want to just point this out. The OS top 10 actually has uh, updating libraries and frameworks as part of it. Um, A9. Yep. But also the ASVS has it as well as a level one control. So this is actually expected behavior. Um, obviously, one of the biggest breaches in recent times was uh, Equifax, which was Apache Commons. Um, and essentially, they knew about the problem because they did actually they have dependency checkers but they didn't actually get it fixed in time and they got owned in a major way. The lack of patching in a rapid form, which is actually cultural in my view, um, cost them at least $200 million so far. And so from my perspective, I would probably say you need to adjust your culture if you're not automatically patching and keeping up with the latest because you're developing code that goes into production and it's gonna be in production for some time. And if you're like any large organization, you've got hundreds, if not thousands of apps, you don't have time to come back and maintain all of those apps proactively. Like Equifax obviously just couldn't do it even as a major financial institution. So from my perspective, if you're getting your developers culturally to target the latest versions of everything, not only does it minimize the amount of refactoring and bug checking you need to do, the culture says we're gonna do the latest because we may not get to change this for six to nine months. If they're sitting there using old libraries today and two years down the track, they get owned by something that was fixable at the time they went into production, that's just not okay. We need to do, we absolutely need to change the culture of development shops to target the latest versions of frameworks. They often have far less security bugs to Jim's point because so many things are not reported. For example, I know that in Apple, unless there's a public um, CVE, they will not tell you they've fixed silently a whole bunch of security issues. And in fact, when you look at like iOS 12 with the new processes, there's a whole bunch of security things that they went into that 
that never got reported, but then that gave people clues about how to attack the older versions of the software. So please change the culture to keep updated. Framework updates are important. I think that's uh, definitely a big thing we see on the, the pen testing side of things and, and the security research side of things, where not all security fixes are, are reported as security fixes. And we, we often see, you know, generic bug fixes being uh, just, just the, the change log note. And, um, you know, we're, we're adapting that as security researchers where you have, you know, a patch Tuesday comes out, all the patches are released, and then we have exploit Wednesday where we start pulling patches apart to try and work out what was changed. So if you're not, if you're not uh, dealing with that culturally in an organization, you're missing out on the advantage that the, the attackers have. And sometimes from the cultural side of things, it, it might just be that idea of, oh, we're doing it this way because it worked previously. You know, when, when you're learning development and when you're, when you're building into things, quite frequently you'll, you'll code something in a certain way or you'll use a certain code sample because it worked before, right? So you're, you're trying to save yourself time with that efficiency. And if you don't keep security at the forefront, you might just use an old code sample, which relies on an old framework, just because you didn't think about it. So that cultural change of kind of embedding and keeping libraries up to date can, can help with that on the subconscious side of things. One of the things that, that uh, when you truly follow DevOps and you do chaos engineering and you do A-B testing and you do some of these techniques that are later in the life cycle, um, if that culture combines with the culture of you know, integrating and pulling the latest patch uh, or library versions at the front of the life cycle, um, then um, you're able to engage your orchestration software, um, whether it's, you know, Kubernetes or whether it's something like middleware and OpenShift to ultimately deliver your software uh, and your infrastructure as a population or a herd. Um, and so you get the combined benefits of the latest software in a portion of the population, uh, but varied configurations across the population as a whole. And uh, in that case, you have built resilience in, I don't know if it was um, Jim or, or uh, Tony that had mentioned that kind of as a, a consequence of maturity. But when you build you know, resilience and that variability in, because you're using A-B testing and chaos engineering as sort of operations practices, when you find as an organization that there's a vulnerability in a particular library and version, your, your, your software delivery pipeline is ready to deal with that and adjust the population. Um, so that's, that's, that's sort of a, a truly DevOps security practice that people don't really talk about. Um, I'd be interested, Holly, from your perspective as to whether or not that creates herd immunity and a more challenging discovery process for attackers uh, or if it creates net opportunity to them, um, because there still remains some vulnerable, you know, portion of the population, even if it's harder to to get to. It, it can actually work both ways, depending on how you're delivering testing. So, so one of the things that we do uh, from the attacking side of things is we we want to keep an eye on when things have changed, right? Because if you're if you're building in um, system upgrades into your security workflow, that's good. But if you're just patching things because a patch is available and you're not necessarily testing that, then then there can be a problem there because you know change can bring problems itself. It can bring um, misconfigurations, those kinds of things. So so it can work both ways. But it's definitely something we keep an eye on from the testing side of things. Is like oh, this system has been changed. Therefore, we need to take a look at it from from an attack point of view. It, it is something that we're aware of. Um, certainly, if uh, if systems are well up to date and we can spot these, there's like an outdated version or something like that, we're gonna presume that there's gonna be some, some issues there. It's like, why hasn't this been updated? It's probably because it's gonna break something up. Or alternatively, it might be just because this system is so key, they are worried about it breaking something and therefore they're not updating it. So there's something important there, just from like a kind of OSINT side of things, intelligent side of things. This system hasn't been updated, there might be something valuable within it. So it, it, it does help, it does factor into our approach from the testing methodology. Can we start Richard, taking on some of the really questions good. in Slideo now? We have a lot of questions decked up from our audience. I recommend we start marching through some of those because it will trigger a lot of conversation. Before we do, I just wanted to um, follow up with a couple of things that Holly said real quickly. Absolutely. You, you talked about culture, you talked about DevOps, and you talked about shift left. So I think it'd be important that we address uh, what shift left is all about uh, for those people that are on this that are not that familiar with the term and what and how it relates to DevOps. Uh, so 
if you want to start off, Holly, and then I'm sure uh, Mr. Cowboy will have a few things to add as well as others. I think uh, the opening statement that I made like right at the beginning of this was uh, you want to move testing earlier in the life cycle. And I think something that I didn't get the point across of with that is um, moving testing earlier into the life cycle gives you the benefit of detecting issues sooner. That doesn't mean that where you detect them, you have to fix them. You're not necessarily having to fix all security issues in code. You, know, you have options when it comes to fixing. You can fix it in code, you can offset it with compensating controls, you can offset it with insurance, whatever, right? There's a whole big side to security there, but um, just on, on that side of things, there is a, a fundamental problem if you are testing just before software goes live, because if there is some large problem with it, a problem with uh, the design, for example, you could have handled that sooner. You could have um, you know, taken that pain in smaller chunks. So just that idea of, of moving things earlier in the life cycle from a detection point of view um, can make releases more efficient and can deal with the adversarial side of security where software developers might see the testing team as, as a gate. You know, we work really hard on building this application and they go to the testing team and they tell us we did an awful job. Whereas if you're, if you're moving earlier in the life cycle, you can start dealing with that cultural side of things of, of having your developers and having your um, security representatives just working together a lot better. Holly, are there other application security activities that we, we should be pushing left as well? I naively want to say you should push as many of them left as possible, but, but it, isn't, it isn't necessarily the best approach because context makes things complicated, right? The, the more you can move earlier on the detection side of things, that that's better. You don't necessarily have to fix every vulnerability, how and where you find it. You know, um, in terms of the discoverability, the exploitability of vulnerabilities aren't necessarily the, the same thing. You know, we talked about this earlier when we we're looking at threat modeling. But yeah, if you can push detection sooner in the life cycle, it will give you more time to decide how you want to deal with that. So I'll say that, you know, definitively you want to throw in threat modeling earlier in that life cycle. Again, it adds a lot of context uh, beyond just simply the software security itself, but understanding things again, like the data consumption model, your supply chain uh, uh, dependencies with other um, you know, cloud related services, API components from extraneous third parties, um, you know, looking at things a little bit more holistically uh, and going back to Richard's example that he had where a developer exclaimed, that is a third party library, that's not my code. And staying topical to your question, uh, Richard, on just culture and DevOps uh, shifting left, I think it's, it's really a mindset change. What are you doing? You can call it whatever buzzword you want, but the mindset of being able to determine what activities do you need to do in an application security program that's going to, you know, and then define your goals. Is it gonna improve my, reduce the risk in my threat model? Is it gonna, you know, reduce the liability, you know, for privacy violations? Is it going to reduce the opportunity for SLA violations? You know, the list can go on and on. And that's why context is so important in application security because that context is going to help to drive and make those um, decisioning to be a lot more credible and to be business supported. I think one th key thing here is that I think security used to be seen as some sort of magic, particularly some of the crazy things that pen tests were doing and developers didn't understand it at all. Uh, and I think we want, we're want we getting to the stage, I hope, where security is just seen as another absolutely desirable attribute of software. So we want software that can perform, that is usable, is maintainable, all these good things, but it needs to be secure as well. And that's how I got into security, because I wanted my applications to be good good quality applications. And that was just one of the aspects that I realized I didn't know enough about. And I needed to learn more. So we want to make sure that developers understand that it is, you know, they need to know more about security. They don't have to come professional pen testers. They don't have to be um, focused just on performance or any one aspect, but they need to have a, a good grounding of all the aspects that make a good application, a good application and robust and suitable for purpose. So, I mean, in my former employer, we've been saying shift left since 1998. What if we're all wrong? What if we need to shift right to be earlier? What if 
the context of Kubernetes and cloud configuration isn't available until later in the life cycle and you can't really do a threat model until you understand those things. What if what we really mean is that we should be doing things at the right life cycle phase as early as diagnostically reasonable? I agree, I agree John. That, 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 that's, a, that's a good fine tuning of the ship left concept. And it was Tony who said that to me first earlier. So thank, good job, Tony. So the, the, the challenge I think we have is as software eats the world and infrastructure becomes code, software is shifting right, which means to shift left, we will have to shift right. And that's confusing, but the reality is Amazon's deployed a crap load of code. And when you build on Amazon, you know, or when you build on Kubernetes, you're building on a crap load of code. And um, you may want to wait, in fact, especially if you're using dynamic orchestrators and things like that, to understand that. And so, um, anyways, yeah, so I, I, that will mean different things to different development cultures. And so what I, would, what I would encourage people to do is, yes, do things as early as possible but don't bend yourself into a pretzel to do something early on in dev that you can do much faster or more accurately later. And Jack, Jack may have some more on that, but. I definitely agree with that from a, um, I think a part of it might have been marketing versus security, where what we really mean is don't do security last minute. And to counter right. that idea of That's doing security fact. last minute, we have overly broadly uh, brushed this, we'll do it as early as possible. And, you know, we say push left, push left, push left. I think you're absolutely right. It's just the security team trying to avoid security being last minute by trying to get ourselves in early. And there is definitely an extreme where that itself becomes a problem. And so the majority, of the, yeah. the majority <laughs> of the population are actually take the, you know, if you basically have that narrative of like, what if we're wrong? Let's, you know, go ahead and move further right. Um, the majority of the population that are running businesses around products and software are actually might abuse that to again, delay security with, on code that they actually own and manage. So again, it goes back to clarifying uh, clearly what that really means because that, that is a very dangerous notion to, to present. So I, one I, of the things I, I just want to, no, Jim, just one, Andrew, just go one, ahead. Yeah. About five years ago, we went, I've been in the industry and I've seen all the feds uh, where governance was big, firewalls and SSL were big, and then building left was big and then testing. And then there was the fatalistic, you're gonna get hacked. We need to make sure that all the money is spent on actually detection and um, uh, response. The reality is after doing this for so long, we need to spread the investment in security evenly across the entire life cycle. I don't think it's important to say that you shouldn't invest left. Um, I know that John's trying to be contrary um, and that's fine, but I've seen this so many times where we've jumped on one particular bandwagon and I'm a big believer in building security in. Uh, an example is React. React was designed with security in mind. It's an automatically secure uh, framework for the most part. And by building it in, you don't have to consider it so hard. However, I do want people, if you're at a CISO level, I want you to understand I've seen all of the fads and I really want you to invest it evenly across the field rather than concentrating on one sole thing. Because I think to concentrate on just EDR or to concentrate just on threat modeling or just concentrate on tooling, I think is a mistake. Unfortunately, it's not an easy answer. The fads that go through our industry are not evidence-based we need to cover off for risk management purposes, all of the different aspects and throughout the life cycle. Hey, Jack, I know you wanted to uh, jump in a couple of times. That's in this is a tough crowd to, to do that. So go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's cool. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, with regards to um, just some of the things John was touching on, I mean, uh, so we moved from this model where uh, the, the, the onus is on developers and they can deploy things um, safely uh, to architectures that uh, kind of put them on guardrails. And so uh, to John's point, um, uh, you know, there are things that we can push a little bit further right. And uh, so it really depends on the technology stack you're using. Um, you know, do you live in the cloud? Are you built on top of containers and serverless functions? Or 
Um, you know, do you live in a data center and you still have monolithic apps and you haven't rebuilt those yet? So, uh, you know, to Andrew's point, right, it's, uh, there, there's a lot of different things you have to kind of cover uh, in the stack. Um, but yeah, in, in, in modern architecture, I mean, you have opportunities to do things a little bit different, uh, which kind of challenges, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, this uh, marketing teams have built a lot of marketing material on kind of the shift left term. So uh, in some cases, they don't kind of want, want to unwind that. But in reality, um, yeah, a lot of things kind of do push a little bit further uh, right in the life cycle. Um, things like observability um, are really important. Uh, and we can't, we can't observe code um, that's not running anywhere, right? So, um, you know, very different considerations depending on the technology stack you're deployed to. I, I, I want to count on Jack, Jack and John. I think you can only really shift right security in AppSec counter to what the shift left movement means. Shift left movement says, let's do standard security activities early in the life cycle. In general, let's avoid doing things like running a static analysis engine for the first time right before we go live. That's conventional wisdom. Is That's usually a bad idea. You want to run it throughout the dev cycle. Here's my point, though. I think you can shift right in your security only when someone else has shifted left for you. Like you're using a mature framework with heavy guardrails for the developer, or you're using a cloud infrastructure with limited deployment models with a lot of the controls built in and so on. So that's my answer to you, John. Yeah, you can shift right in your application security, but only if someone else has shifted left for you. Thank you. So we've gotten a ton of questions from you folks that are watching this. I wanna thank you for that. Actually, just a bit of info. Well, we're very proud. We've got about 230 of you who that registered. I don't know how many are actually watching this, but um, thank you for, for joining us. We've got some questions here. Uh, I want to give you your opportunity to be heard indirectly through these questions. So uh, any of our panelists, uh, take a look in what you see and uh, feel free to jump in and uh, commenting or answering any of these. So I'll take the C-level one just straight up. I don't think that there's a golden ratio that you should basically uh, say you need, you know, one AppSec developer for every five developers. That I don't think is a reasonable way to do it, especially if you've got a thousand apps, you'll end up with, you know, 2000 information security professionals. What you do need to do is think about metrics that will allow you to get through the risk that you have and then hire the number of application security experts to keep within those metrics. Um, I think saying that you need, you know, hard and fast rules that you're going to spend 5% of your uh, um, security budget on application security is undervaluing it. But for some organizations, it may be too much. I'd love to hear from other people in the team uh, about what they think. I'm going to quickly say one per team. The automotive Linux group flat out said in their security guidance, the single most important factor to determine if you're going to do secure software is if you have an expert embed it with your team. The way this, and, and not everyone has that many AppSec experts, and the extension of having one expert per team is to have a security champion program where there's at least one dedicated application security resource per piece of software you're building. And that, I, I think that's the way to roll, Andrew. Yeah, I want to echo that. I just want to say that, you know, in, in Europe, largely, they've, they've, I think in my perspective, largely adopted the security champion model um, at a more swifter pace than, you know, in the United States. And, you know, it's always easier to evangelize on themes from within a group in a constructive manner uh, versus outside of the group. And security experts, if you will, <clears throat> they, they know about dysfunction, but oftentimes they don't know about how to fix that dysfunction within the function of the application or function of the software. And for that reason, you do wanna cultivate a security champion within the group. That's gonna get you a lot more of a, of, of a residency, if you will, within the team that's building the software. If now the team that's building the software, we, we talked about changing the culture, we talked about changing the mindset, is now able to understand that and not say, oh, that's not my code, it's a third party library, but instead, interesting that third-party library interfaces or interacts with my application components in the following ways that I'm concerned and let me do something about it, then <clears throat> that, that's a bigger win. So completely want to echo the security champion uh, recommendation there. So what's interesting about the, 
there be some data vary on this, but I mean, it's very consistent across verticals at, at, at least like one to a hundred, one, one security, uh, dedicated security professional to, to uh, every hundred developers. But as champions, um, you know, programs grow out, you get more intimacy. There's been a very, very interesting shift over the last two years and especially the last year towards engineering led initiatives where there is a champion per team sort of self-actualizing that security expertise. Um, and it, it's riffing on, um, you know, things like Andrew mentioned with React, like the frameworks and understanding what they do for security. Um, but security and context around things like threat modeling are kind of like politics, right? It's all best local. Those people from within the team who are steeped in the development context and in the customer requirements may do a better job of contextualizing threat modeling and remediating than you know, the central one to a hundreds. And so the trend we've seen over the last year of people self-actualizing and picking one out of 10, you know, one per scrum team kind of thing, uh, saying deputizing themselves as security champions, I think is a very positive action. Someone else. I think both, John, a combination of security champions scattered to each team with the central with the central security architect group guiding those champions, I seem to be extraordinarily effect, effective as well. So, and I think that that open Sam and BSIM is going to echo this as well. That we see maturity. We, we, we well, open Sam measures maturity both in terms of do you have a security champion program and do you have a central a central architect group of some kind dictating policy? And I, I think we see those in BSIM activities as well. So I like both but I digress. We talked about RASP today. Does anyone want to comment on it? Uh, just really quickly. I think if you're using WAFs, RASP is the complementary version of that. Um, I'm not a huge believer in just loading up on tools. You should probably make sure that it's going to provide some value to you. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with RASP, what it does is it sits there and uses reflection to actually work out if there's attacks happening to your code as it stands. Um, and then it blocks those actions. So it's actually a proactive, um, uh, you know, dynamic at runtime type of um, protection. Um, if you're using a WAF, you probably should look at it. If you're not using a WAF, then your code needs to be protected against um, those sorts of uh, attacks. Not every piece of code can actually use a RASP because it actually, as I said, it relies upon reflection support within the frame, uh, within the um, application itself. Um, my personal opinion on it is it's early days for it. Um, it probably will provide value for some, um, but you're probably better off um, investing in other areas as well. Yeah, let, let me let me pile on here. RASP expands to runtime application security protection. Pretty generic. It falls into two categories of tools. Um, those that protect against command injection on legacy languages that are compiled like C and C++, and those that tackle web-based vulnerabilities. The tools range, and there's a lot of overlap and confusion into how the sort of submarkets there work. Um, there's also confusion from the IAST vendors who have built engines that they repurpose for RASPs. What I would say is if I was in charge of a security program, I would want the ability to respond to attacks with a Band-Aid that's already in place, that doesn't, co that doesn't cost me maintainability or performance characteristics. So either a next generation WAF, as, as, as Andrew mentioned, or, or a RASP-like technology, or stuff you bake into your application may provide you that ability to respond quickly. However, neither of those things really exonerates you from going back and providing a real durable fix to the reason that your application was being probed or exploited. So you can use them, you can use them prophylactically. They may be good to have in place in a pinch, but you still have to build security in. I will add to that and just simply say, especially with like Java applications, you know, RASP has its merits depending upon the, um, the goal. So if you're going to just simply invest or kick the tires on RASP because you really are, 
uh, for lack of a better word, lazy or not really too inclined to remediate some of the code that you've actually authored or even the environment um, to upgrade the environment to you know, a better runtime, then probably not the best decision. And you should fix those sort of things before you actually invest in a tool to be the savior. Now, if you do have a legacy you know, platform and for various interrelated dependencies, you are not able to you know, update you know, in different environment variables and language uh, frameworks and whatnot, then RAS might be an actual an interim solution that you add again to a layered architecture for security uh, to Andrew's point. You know, you know, there's not enough people in security and I'm not sure about the development side of things. I think there's a stress level there too, getting enough good resources. <clears throat> so we, we always wanna mentor and encourage the next generation, right? Uh, there's a question about uh, students. Um, do we have any advice for students that wanna get into this field? Um, it's open-ended, but anyone wanna jump in there with, with some advice for our friends? Learn to code. I, I say having a background as a, as a web and API developer will, will take you far. And, and, if, and to narrow that advice down, learn JavaScript, learn some Node, learn React, and learn how to really, and learn how to interact with the data source, like a database, learn SQL or learn object relational mapping and be able to build an app as a full stack developer, even not enterprise class, just enough where you're dangerous. And that foundation will serve you in all of AppSec. And, and, this, and this offends people because there's a lot of people in AppSec who don't have a development background. And when I say this, they get offended. It is not my intention to offend those who don't write code. I'm just saying, if you do, it will be a better foundation for everything else you do in IT. I'm not offended. Yeah, I agree with you, Jim. I mean, there is a lot of people that take offense to say, oh, if I don't write, write code, that means I'm a bad application security person. And that's not the case. That's not what's being said. Yeah, I'm not saying that. there is obviously merit in thinking adversariously against an application or software product. But, you know, the, the recommendations that Jim has is of, of being learning how to actually develop software is is incredible i mean i've been in itis for 25 years and i i shifted from an engineering role to a development role and that opened up the eyes because now you have context on things that we've all touched upon passively like you know actually being a part of a software development life cycle right checking in code these types of activities that go along with an actual program so um i think you know being able to understand different languages, what sort of, especially for like the frameworks that different languages offer might have native security capabilities that you can actually leverage for some, you know, native countermeasures, right? In your application. So that's, there's a lot of ROI there. So couldn't agree with you more, Jim. And get involved in OWASP, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Jack, I Menino, Jack Menino is one of my favorite CEOs in AppSec. Tony, you are, John is, you're all C-level AppSec professionals. Jack's the CEO. Hey, Jack, how often do you touch code as a CEO? Uh, pretty often. It's uh, one of my hobbies. I mean, I, I do my management stuff, but uh, I find, honestly, being able to dig into code, write code, um, I mean, it makes me better at what I do. I understand, I mean, where the industry's going, uh, where people's pain points are. And so, you know, part of my job is, uh, you know, being out there and, and talking to people. And so I you know, personally, I like to be educated on those things and not just be a talking head. So, um, yeah, I mean, coding is, is, is fun to me. I don't play video games. And, uh, you know, the last time I looked around, I kind of have nowhere to go. So, yeah, coding is a good pastime for me. I think a thing that I'd like to jump in there is when it, when it comes to, like, building into security and, and, and kind of, like, breaking into it, I think one of the big things to, to bear in mind is, is check in with other teams and check in with the, the other side of whatever it is. So, you know, if you've decided that you want to get into security to become a pen tester and that's it, you just want to be a pen tester. Um, a pen tester is useless if they can only find vulnerabilities, but don't understand how to remediate them or don't understand how to explain that to the other teams. So I think a big thing, you know, when you find the niche that you want to work towards, it just make sure that you regularly check in with other teams. That might be, you know, uh, joining groups, joining panels like this kind of thing. But just bear in mind that you need to keep some broadness to, to your experience and to your skill sets. Great, great. Um, just, just remember, however, again, I'm, I just, I, I'm sorry, I guess I put on this, these, this pair of underwear this morning, but uh, coding is not just the full stack that, that Jim talked about anymore. 
if you don't understand the infrastructure that has become code, you won't understand how a modern application is built. This is actually uh, continuing education for those who just learned to purely develop like myself. Uh, but it also means that those in the SRE and operator community who may have done operational security or pipeline management uh, or infrastructure management may know a lot about Terraform, Ansible, and other coding languages or configuration languages, they're going to affect the application security posture. So you don't have to start in the ivory tower of, of computer engineering and software development. You can come at it from the operations infrastructure as code space and generate a ton of application security value in a modern app these days. If you don't know that stuff, learn it, or you'll be like the pen tester that Holly described, because you won't know how to orchestrate and redeploy the app securely when you're giving remediation advice. You know, it sounds just as tone deaf. And John, if, you, if you're doing infrastructure and you're, do, you're, you're an admin, then at least learn scripting to automate your admin job. So I, I mean, some kind of coding of any level, even your bash scripts to admin a network. And I'm happy that that's something to get you rolling. I don't yeah, I want to say too, a lot of the service providers out there that are infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, containers as a service providers out there actually are using languages that are very similar to some of the coding languages that are out there. So, I mean, it's not an either or, it's definitely an and, and, you know, um, you know, there's definitely enough out there to learn from, but if you want to dip your toe into AppSec, uh, I think a lot of the recommendations made, definitely the OWASP uh, organization getting involved, joining the Slack channels, you know, interfacing with the people, asking questions, partaking in a project, giving your time and effort to make a project better, maybe joining Simon's team. Uh, there's a lot of phenomenal projects out there that need good coders and you can, you know, um, you can basically uh, uh, try out some of your coding chops uh, through those mediums. Hey, Andrew, you wanted to talk about standards, I believe. On mute. Wrap. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as a person who actually sets standards uh, with in combination with folks like Jim, Dave, Daniel Cuthbert, Josh Grossman and others, we are trying to make sure that we're aligned with other standards so that CISOs and whatnot do not have to comply with an unlimited number of standards. And I'd like for if there's anyone on this call who actually sets standards as well, such as being involved in PCI DSS, please talk to us because we'd like to make sure that we have the same outcomes. And that's one of the reasons why we aligned with NIST 800-63 for authentication, for example, so that there's less to be done. So that if you comply with us, you've got, PC, you've got NIST 800-63 and so on. Um, the question is whether or not companies do this at all levels. And that affects the ASVS at a much greater level. And we are hearing that pretty much it can be siloed. I would like to un understand from our other panelists what they believe is actually happening in these organizations. But as the person who's helped set the ASVS, I'm generally dealing with the development team rather than the ops team or uh, operational security. Um, we get a lot of feedback from developers. We don't get a lot of feedback from um, those folks who are, to John's point, running the infrastructure behind modern applications. So this is something that we're, we're studying in the context of vSIM and, and, and I'm studying more broadly, and there's a real sea change here. If software is eating the world, then the policy document that was Word or that is even like test cases like ASVS, it's becoming code too, just like the infrastructure, just like the deployment scripts, just like those other things. So what firms are doing, uh, Amazon does this, others, uh, they're saying, look, our standard is our use of this library, our use of this protocol, this way configured these ways with these certificates. This is our security standard. You can do whatever you want in your team, but you're not going to be able to connect to our service unless you do it our way securely. Um, so I would say if you're in an organization and you look around for standards and policies, look beyond the paper. There may be standards and conventions that are baked into your selection of libraries and frameworks, protocols, the way you've configured environments so that developers or operators are set up to do it either securely or not, you know, be part of that, that, that bus. And that's actually a really advanced way to roll out software-based standards 
um, that's frictionless to developers. You help them do it the secure way by default, and you give them the ability to do it however way they want, but they're gonna be challenged to integrate with your secure infrastructure unless they follow your standards, which you've provided them an easy on-ramp to do. Standards and policy, just like everything else is becoming software. Yeah, so Andrew, um, a lot of the things over the past you know, a uh, couple of years have evolved where there's definitely some automation with, and I'll use the dirty C word of compliance, um, but you know, when people think of compliance, they think regulation. There's also internal compliance that leverages those standards and frameworks as an internal, you must do, right? Uh, whatever your alignment is, COVID, NIST, ISO, whatever. And you know, other industries have actually begun that automation before the information security industry, actually. Um, reg tech, you know, a lot of, uh, and especially in the banking financial community, they've looked to ways at how do we can incorporate AML, KYC type requirements in investments and in banking into our products. Um, so definitely the future is, and this is one of the things I wanted to talk about, I didn't really talk about enough during the automation question was really, that is really a new echelon of automation, really is trying to be able to operationalize the traditional PDS standards that are living on you know, companies' confluence sites or SharePoint sites or as shelfware somewhere within a security group. How do you take that and put it as actual code that begins to verify things across the full entire stack? Your infrastructure, your, your CSPs, your cloud service providers often have the native capability to basically see if you're in misalignment to, for example, CIS controls as a simple one. Um, but you can go down the full stack, infrastructure, platform, you know, uh, application, and, and see if you have some misalignment, but using those codified, if you will, uh, standards that are um, in structured, in some sort of structured language that can be used to be uh, validated against those environments. So you can see if you have true governance, right? We talk about security governance, the open SAM obviously is a great, has great components about governance, but operationalizing components uh, in governance is very much here already and gonna be building in the future. Listen, I wanna uh, jump in and unfortunately we're out of time. There's more questions and I wanna thank everyone who put those on there, took the time to think of them. Um, I also wanna thank this amazing group of panelists. Uh, we've given you a lot to think about out there, um, a lot to potentially talk to your decision makers, uh, executive teams where you work, do not be afraid to approach executive management because you'll need their buy-in quite a lot. And we wanna see a, a lot of collaboration between infosec and application development. I mean, you guys gotta be married, right? Otherwise this thing fails. So a lot of what we talked about today is culture, right? Um, but we're, you know, people like us are available uh, if you wanna reach out. Uh, we're all on LinkedIn, we're all on Twitter. Uh, we very, we're very busy, but we also care. Um, also, uh, you know, I'm biased, but I am on the Global OWASP board and both Jim and Andrew have been there, giving up a lot of their valuable uh, personal time for that. Um, look into OWASP, OWASP.org, unbelievable amount of tools, standards, templates that you could use today if you're not already. Um, frameworks, you've got to build, if you don't have a framework, uh, you have to do it, right? Um, and I also encourage you, for those of you who are local here in LA, uh, a little commercial here, but I am entitled, um, look up OWASPLA.org. Right, we meet. As a matter of fact, next Wednesday, a week from today, we'll be having a virtual meeting with Michael Howard from Microsoft, talking about security in Azure. Uh, he's incredibly well known in the field. You might want to check us out next week. And then issala.org is the website for ISSA here in Los Angeles. Um, I think that about wraps it up. Again, thank you to everybody for taking your time to do this. I had a really good time listening to you. Uh, I've been admiring many of you for a while. Thank you for, for doing this for ISSA and for the community. And uh, stay safe, everybody. And we'll see you 